Welcome back to Martins and More. My name is Mari Rutch. And I'm Spoon Phillips. And today's episode is brought to you by the Blue Ridge BR-283. The BR-283 is an updated version of the 283A. Combine the finest modern workmanship, the rarest tone woods, and lavish abalone pearl inlay on every border, and you have the finest new Blue Ridge money can buy. This triple O size guitar is just the right size for comfort and ease of playing, but retains the big tone, clarity, and volume that's perfect for live performance. For more information about the Blue Ridge BR-283, please visit marrysmusic.com today. What's going on today, Spoon? Well, I am enjoying a nice summer day, hanging out with an old pal. Well, when you guys get done talking, would you mind joining me on my <laughs> podcast? <laughs> I meant you. Oh, well, thank you. I, I'm, uh, I'm honored to be called Old Pal. It's going to be a good show today. I actually spent some time surfing YouTube, and I came across a topic that I was going to talk to you about anyway, but now it feels like it's the perfect timing. I should ask you and the listeners, have you seen casino guitars on YouTube yet? They're in North Carolina. Yes, I have seen them. They put on a really good show, Baxter and Jonathan, most of the time. And I, I know they probably have more videos than just the two of those guys. But the point I'm trying to eventually get to, they had a, a podcast or an episode on YouTube that I just watched most of this morning. I don't remember what the video was called, but the topic was, why would some guitar stores in the summer of 2023 still have an online business model that's either you can't go into the store at all, or it's contactless curbside, maybe it's in-store by appointment only, those sort of things. And the reason I'm bringing this up and it feels like it's timed correctly, as we're taping this program in the middle of July, Mari's Music is finally ready to consider making some room in our showroom for some more in-store appointments. And it's been something we've actually had to consider ever since we went online only when the pandemic did start. So maybe today, Spoon, you and I can bounce around some ideas. We can reference some of the talking points that casino guitars uh, you know, brought to light, but they bring up some really good things to talk about. And I wonder how many people out there listening have a local store in their neighborhood. If they do, please consider throwing some comments together in the comment section of the YouTube version of this video. Is your local guitar store or music store in general open to the public? Or if it's not, uh, how are they treating such things? But I wonder, I should ask you off the, off the top spoon, what is going on as far as your neighborhood stores? How are they treating in-store in store sales? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, the one that comes to mind is Musurgia, which is online known as Retrofret. And that used to be a small store on top of a or pipe organ factory. And the guy who ran, owns the store, you would actually go up and you'd literally, well, there's two entrances. One of them actually went partially through his apartment back to where the store was. And you'd step across this rooftop on a little planked path and um, they have since moved to a bigger location and they weren't exactly appointment only but they were obscure enough that a lot, a lot of people never went there so they did a lot of on, you know on uh, the internet sales and, and like they even had a separate name for their internet you know business um, <laughs> There isn't really any guitar shops that I would call a neighborhood guitar shop for me. That was it. And even that was several blocks away. That was a you know, good mile walk away. And now they're even farther away. And our friend Tony Phillips used to live virtually around the corner from them. So I'm sure he wasn't happy about them moving. But, um, <laughs> and then I, could, I can also think of Tom Crandall's guitar in Manhattan. Again, a, you know, a small, uh, a relatively small guitar shop that's you know not a big corporate entity and um, they also relocated and and to a slightly bigger place and probably just in time to not be able to have customers but they finally have customers you know now too and I'm not exactly sure when they opened the, but a major difference uh, for me is I live in a huge metropolitan area and with mass transit so it's easy to get to guitar shops and it's not uh, the same thing for out across America, like out across Ohio, where I grew up. And our friend uh, Ruitz is is, um, is up in northern Ohio. And, you know, his uh, experiences of wanting to visit guitar shops across that era, and even now, because he has to travel a long way to do it, um, 
I can certainly understand from that point of view of why uh, dealers have uh, have stuck with either not being open or uh, by appointment only because it doesn't necessarily behoove them to have to be there in presentable clothes um, and all that, um, you know, for eight hours a day if they're not in a location that's going to get a lot of unannounced customers. So I, I can certainly see that point of view. But I think it's an interesting question of are those uh, stores starting to open up? And I'm, I'm very happy to hear that you are uh, going to make uh, room in your shop uh, for customers to come in. I've always enjoyed the little uh, videos you would make when, when people would stop by the shop. So I hope to see some more of those in the near future, it sounds like. Oh, yeah, the drop by. If we can put some more of those videos together, they were so much fun. Matter of fact, I, I meant to go and recycle some of them. And every time I started looking through old videos, I, I felt so nostalgic. It was so much fun when we can get somebody to come in. And uh, the Casino Guitars video really pointed out the, uh, it brought the point home that you could have somebody in a store coming in looking for strings. And before you know it, you spent a half hour not just giving them advice on which acoustic strings to buy, but that builds up some conversation and before you know it walk-ins or appointments when someone's in the store it's hardly just reaching to the shelf taking the item going to the counter taking out your wallet and leaving there's always an interaction that might seem like it takes a lot less time online but the big point of that video that i took away from it uh, when they produced it was maybe a lot of stores during the pandemic had to rely on selling online whether it's interaction on the phone by email or just automated websites, but you can get a lot done if, I'll, I'll tell you the truth, if I'm answering emails in the morning, I could answer one person, go to the second person, answer them. By the time I'm answering the third email, the first person might have replied to that email, and within 15 minutes, I could have three specific people, I'll say solved, if that's the right word, and we can basically take care of a lot of information very, very quickly, whether or not the recipient of the email has an opportunity to read it and reply that quickly is, is all on their time. But if I would take that, you know, maybe the first hour of my morning, not dedicated to answering emails, and I was actually in the shop here selling a pack of strings, the other side of that coin can get really uncomfortable where three people might be waiting for a reply from me since last night. And if I don't reply to that very quickly, I could make one local string customer happy enough and three online customers whether they're buying strings eric clapton strings or eric clapton triple 28s uh they could be you know hey where are you so it's the whole thing where we've totally dedicated ourselves to whatever makes the most sense anyway since we started and after, i don't know if you remember the story but we began as primarily brick and mortar in 2003 and emails and phone calls were an afterthought and as soon as you recognize that was a mistake and we devoted all of our primary time to emails and phone calls and make the local side of the business the afterthought, the business at least tripled immediately. So we found our foothold for sure is best served taking care of the online customer if we have to choose. And, and that's the un unhealthy or the unattractive part of it. You do have to choose if you don't have five or six people on a staff and a really, really big showroom where you can, well, even if you did, if you have all these people, do you want to dedicate all of them to online, all of them to locals, split them up how you think? But the video that I was watching earlier made a, a really good point of now that we probably could, in a healthy way, allow people to come into the stores. And I don't want to get into the what I mean by the healthy part of it, but 2023, we feel reasonably confident now we don't have to use the word safety as an excuse to not bring people in here. Now we're finally selling through some inventory that was totally clogging up the retail space. How should we actually treat this? Should we open the doors wide open again? Should we go back to being appointment only? Should we just do contactless curbside? Frankly, we're toying with the idea of maybe have somebody, if somebody wants to buy an instrument from us long distance and pick it up, you should buy it first make the trip and tell us which day you want to pick it up and we'll set an appointment time for you. You can come in and, and say, hey, I, I bought that D41. I want to play it before I take it home. And then you can play it and make sure you love it. If you don't love it, we can completely undo the, the transaction. These are things we're just, I'm thinking about off off top of my head. And I'm, they're certainly not even concrete enough for me to tell you, of course, with everybody listening, what we're going to do because we're not sure yet. But in parallel with this whole video that I saw, we put a post up on YouTube a couple weeks ago 
asking our YouTube community, and we got almost 50 votes so far. We're talking about opening the store again, and we basically asked you, uh, those people that were nice enough to comment, if you want to come into Mari's Music and we're going to devote some of that time to doing that, would you want to vote yes? You should do that because the in-store availability offers much more value to me. Would you vote no? The YouTube presence offers much more value to me. And the other two choices were yes, please open up again, but don't stop making demos. And the fourth one, yes, but please don't stop producing podcasts. So the hard and fast problem that I could see already is what are you willing to give up as a Maury's Music listener, potential customer, literal customer? If you see Maury's Music has to basically divvy up some time, where would you like to see us put it? I'll ask you, Spoon, if you know we have to basically put some things on the back burner as far as the YouTube content, what would you be most okay with seeing a... Uh, a reduction, and you probably can't say this podcast because you're on it, but maybe you can. <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to see a reduction of anything. I've all, the whole time you were just saying that, I've been building in my mind of how do you pull it off without right now at least having to hire more staff. And, you know, what, someday if you end up with a much larger store, you may need the larger staff. But um, I guess... You are the face and the public persona of Mars Music. So I would say that it might just mean having to shift uh, some responsibility onto Andrew, sorry, Andrew, uh, so that you remain, <laughs> uh, that, that you have the time to continue making the demos and the shows, you know, the show you do with Marshall. Uh, Martin versus Martin and the inventory show where you play guitars that are in stock and, you know, and, and this podcast, you know, there's, uh, there's only so many hours in a day and only so many days in a week. And, you know, I realized uh, Mari, uh, Mari uh, needs his rest and relaxation, even if his uh, missus sometimes doesn't think that's true. But... Uh, <laughs> So I don't know what to tell you. I would like to see both if possible. So uh, it's a conundrum. It is. And before we get too far into the uh, let's feel sorry for Mari, it's just an awesome problem to have because we could also be saying, hey, we've got to do way more because no one wants to come in the store. Nobody wants to watch and listen. We are extremely grateful and very fortunate that we have this choice to make. I mean, if, if we one that open up the store to appointments and the YouTube was just stinking and we didn't have anybody that wanted to watch or listen to these things, even though it might be an easier thing to do, that wouldn't make me any happier at all. So I'm very glad that we have, you know, programming Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on YouTube to, to try to wrestle with. So if you got this far in this podcast, whether you're listening to it on your favorite platform or on YouTube, this is where I'll stop everything and say thank you very, very much for giving us these decisions to, to be had. So it, it's really a good thing. And... It might make some sense that we're available for appointments maybe one or two days a week. And if, if hypothetically I said Tuesdays before 4 o'clock and Thursdays before 5 o'clock, maybe we could, you know, commit some people, hey, that's, that's how we'll start it. And only until we find out the first 15 customers think that's a terrible idea. I like traveling on Mondays or I want to see you on Wednesdays. I don't want to <laughs> have people come in the store when I'm on camera on Wednesday doing virtual tour and Andrew's upstairs showing guitars and then we need to help each other. It should really be a day where I'm not quote unquote married to looking at the camera. And luckily these Monday programs and the Tuesday program as they stand so far are recorded at least a week or two in advance. So I, I could make some sense of trying to be everywhere at once on certain days, but, but I really do wonder if we did make the shift even if it would mean a little bit of the YouTube community would miss a little bit of the content, would it be a wash because we actually got more people to come in the store? And, you know, not to be a downer, but I have to wonder, is it going to make any difference if we're still appointment only? Because I do think some people love the idea of just driving to a guitar store and playing what they have without telling them they're coming. I think it's going to be quite a while until we can do that sort of thing. But if we did anything like that, I really do think most of the online programming would have to take uh, a pretty big back seat pretty fast. So I, you know, saying this on, on camera, 
and putting it out there in the world. We are looking at definitely considering appointment only in the very near future. If you're hearing this and that sounds like good news to you, you know, please reach out to us at support at mauresmusic.com or give us a call and let us know what you're thinking about. Uh, of course, the second part of that issue is do we have the guitar you want in stock? And that's another, that's for another program altogether. But the long and short of it is there is now at least a little spot in the front sitting room where you actually could do some sitting in the sitting room and you're not going to be moving five or six boxes to get out of the way. And if you would have been in here three months ago, first of all, you wouldn't make it in because right by the front door, uh, you'd have to kind of looks a little <laughs> bit like the maze from The Shining with those hedges, like, but it's all <laughs> Martin boxes. It's finally a little bit more comfortable in here. And I think we're, we're inching towards being even more so before the end of the year. Well, that's a very a good point. Uh, I, I was, was thinking while you were speaking of, you could also try um, one or two days a week that that's when you're open to the public and other days by appointment. That way, if you're going to do Tuesday and Thursday, uh, that's where you were expecting customers to come in. If somebody needs to make an appointment for a Monday because that's their only day, then maybe you guys can still arrange that. That's just a thought off the top of my head. But mm -hmm. you bring up an interesting point about this, and that is a few months ago. Well, a few months ago and in recent times, you couldn't be open, and uh, the, uh, the pandemic that struck the, uh, around the world definitely affected the guitar business in this country. And, uh, and Pennsylvania was one of those states that had a serious shutdown. And of course, the F. Martin in, in just happens to be uh, made in Pennsylvania, so they uh, were part of that. So can you, you know, rather quickly go through how Mars Music had to suddenly deal with the pandemic, how you managed to deal with the pandemic, how that uh, evolved out of the pandemic, and how you guys, you know, fortunately stayed in business. I can touch on it without, you know, getting too far into the weeds, but when the pandemic first did start and shut everything down, it was kind of a domino effect where we already had guitars coming into Martin, or coming out of Martin into Maury's music and, and Blue Ridge the same way. We, there was no shortage of instruments at the beginning, and there was a boom of instrument buyers. So the very early parts, we had a lot of instruments, and I think a lot of our competition might not have. So there was a, a good stretch in the very beginning where Mari's music had more guitars than some of the main competitors might have had in stock. So when Martin stopped building because they couldn't, they couldn't be in their building, there was a, a part where we had a lot of inventory, a lot of customers, and then more than normal, new customers who might have been looking at you know they might have been saying to themselves i'll consider buying online but i'd much rather buy in a store well now you can't now there was a specific amount of time over a year where nobody could buy walking into a guitar store playing at first so you have all of those people that were either i gotta play it before i buy it or i think i have to now they have become online shoppers whether they wanted to or not so there was a big boom we did really well we actually had a, a, a time where our sales were through the roof because we were turning over a lot of instruments. We weren't buying more instruments because Martin wasn't shipping any. So we had a lot of income and an influx of purchasing, or I should say sales. And every month when you know we might buy uh, 70 or 80 Martin guitars while we're selling 50 or 60 you know, out the other door, well, now you're only selling and you're not buying. So it really looked comfortable having a, a situation where we're not spending inventory money, but we are making inventory sales. That was the genesis of us feeling comfortable during it, where we weren't one of those stores that had been relying on local word of mouth and, and brick and mortar sales. Some stores that felt the opposite were definitely in the crunch because I know there were some stores, certainly in lots of neighborhoods where they have a very small online presence, if any, and everything they did week to week and month to month were uh, foot traffic through the door so stores that had relied on the opposite effect, uh, they're the ones that unfortunately, you know, saw the brunt of it. And I, I'm sure there are tons and tons of stores that have a, a healthy mix of maybe only half of their sales were walk-ins and half were online and they just pivoted a little bit. But for us, uh, we were built for it. If, if there's ever a situation where we can't have walk-ins, we weren't one of those stores that really panicked because we weren't doing well with them when we were allowed to back t 2004, 2005. 
it started going so much into the situation of being online. The little town that we're in, quite honestly, every single local sale we had was anything but local. It was somebody from Philly or New Jersey or New York who found our website, drove over an hour, sometimes two hours to see us. So it isn't even like the the neighborhood took care of us while we were working our way through it. We don't have a neighborhood clientele. It just isn't isn't something we've ever enjoyed. So that wasn't as scary as it sounds to some people. And then, you know, fast forward to what we're talking about today. Now that we could consider rolling out the have somebody come in the store, the Casino Guitars video touched on this really well, where some some dealers learn, huh, I don't have to be open. And, and I don't know what percentage of especially Martin dealers across the country ever gave it any thought three years ago, where should I sell online or shouldn't I? But you were forced to try during the pandemic. And I think that taught a lot of uh, stores, if you have to do it, can you survive? And now that you've done it, and maybe some stores survived and thrived, now that you could do either one, what would you choose to do? And he, he named some of the, the dealers, and I'm, I'd have to go back in the video and see who he was talking about. But some dealers that I recognize as really big names, at least I think they had a really big walk-in presence back, you know, four years ago. And they're either completely online only or they're appointment only now. And it's, it's one of those things we talked about earlier. If you can help three or four people in a hurry in an email and they're all getting the answer very, very quickly, that time could be spent helping up to 10 people in an hour versus maybe one person it might take you more than an hour to handle it in the store. And then that's not even admitting what if what if the time you spent in the store doesn't translate to a sale if somebody's going to browse your website email you three times about a guitar and decide not to buy that little chunk of time is lost if somebody comes in a store and spends two hours with you playing the om 21 and the om 28 and they're like i just don't know i got to think about it that has to be a possibility and that can't be frowned upon but you never get those two hours back and then the snowball of it is who did you make upset in those two hours when you weren't able to answer emails while you were dealing with somebody in the store who can't be expected to promise to buy something? I mean, if, if you want to go shopping in 2023 as the buyer, I wouldn't want somebody to tell me that, you know, come out Tuesday, but you better buy it. Like, of course you can't say that. So it's all the time spent and where's the return on the investment and how many people can you basically help in the time you have? So if I didn't get too long winded there, the, the pandemic didn't hurt us as much as some brick and mortar stores, it, it actually helped a tremendous amount in the early onset until until Martin finally had had to tell everybody, now we've lost so much time, you're all gonna wait 16 months for guitars. And that's that's the ugly news of, of the, the marketing side of it. Well, yes, and, and uh, you almost touched on something that I had started touching on earlier. And it's a not that a lot of these smaller stores don't want customers to walk in. Um, sometimes they get so few that it makes more sense, makes much more sense to just do the appointment only. So we know you're going to be there, you know, that you're going to be there and that I know to have stuff ready for you um, because I could be, like you said, I could be down in my office uh, dealing with all of this uh, cyber commerce that we have to deal with these days. And it's very different from a, a, a retailer who has a large staff. So they actually have salesmen, you know, the way a car dealer would have. And so the people that are dealing with the online stuff are not the same people that deal with the customers. So when it comes to the small, you know, mom and pop shops, uh, that's, you know, that's, that's a different kind of juggling act that really you never had to deal with prior to the onset of the serious online commerce era. And then I, we had also mentioned Martin, that Martin had to shut down. At one time, they shut down completely. That every And then even when they were in operation again, only absolute vital people could even go to the factory. So most of the people were, you know, were either furloughed and brought back, or unless they went off and found other jobs, which happened to companies all over America, or uh, they had to work from home. And, and some of them, you know, still work from home several days a week and they and the factory changed you know dramatically i for it affected me i used to do my videos for one man's guitar in martin's sound testing room and they just uh you couldn't go in and you couldn't get in there so they started putting me in the museum and which looks nice because you're on the, the stage where celebrities 
do their little videos and stuff like that. But the sound quality isn't nearly as good as the sound room. <laughs> Though yeah. it's much more comfortable. The sound room gets really hot and uh, and it's uh, you know has a little bit of uh, some airflow in it, but you really have to kind of turn that off if you're trying to make videos. But anyway, um, for so they changed you know they changed how things were done there a lot, and in some respects they've been changed forever. But um, so it is uh, it affected everybody, and in, and like you said, you were one of the lucky ones where it uh, you were in a position to take advantage of it that where some other uh, guitar stores probably weren't. Um, but again, I'll go back to the fact that, that when they're talking about why don't shops open up again, uh, like I said, sometimes some of the shops would not get enough uh, walk-in business that, to justify it if the by appointment works. Because people have, like in your case, people have to travel to your location to to see your stuff it's not like they can just hop on the subway like you do here and have eight different guitar shops to choose from and even go visit all eight of them in the same day if you wanted to do that and um that you know it's it's a it so i think it's relative to the environment and situation um but i also think uh i also think when you do open up and allow people to come into mari's music um it's certainly going to be worth it because Again, you're having the face-to-face -face, uh, relationship building with the people that come in. Also, you get the old sort of general store Cracker Barrel feel when you have the guys sit down and play a couple of songs on the video, you know, and, and talk for a little while. And, and while that takes away of some, you know, some of the important stuff you have to do, that's why I think it's a, it's a matter of figuring out between uh, you and your brother and your wife if you have to maintain such a small staff, of uh, how do you make up for it? How do you how do you juggle the workload? Because you're the only one who can make the videos, and you're the only one that is the face of of uh, Mari's music, and and so you know you're the one whose time has to uh, be available for everything. And that just may mean that uh, Andrew and even Lori, to a certain st extent, may have to take on some of those some of those email tasks and stuff like that because because you still have to make your important customer relation videos and podcasts and and meet and greets and uh, and all that sort of thing. And it's funny because it is certainly a circle. There are a lot of people that want to come in here because they saw the podcast. Like, well, <laughs> you saw the last one because now I'm going to be at the door, <laughs> you know. But and one thing we didn't touch on, though, and I, I shouldn't be, if, if I sound like this is a lot of negatives this first half of the show, uh, there are some positives, too, with, you know, having nobody in the store when somebody wants to talk to you in an email or even if it's a phone call or uh, live by request even when we do those those YouTube shows on a rare occasion where somebody wants me to play the guitar before they buy it This is a guitar that's only been played by me. We inspected it. We played it when we inspected it I probably played it once or twice on a YouTube video whether it was a, a Specific video for that instrument or during virtual tour on Wednesdays You're getting guitars that are factory fresh if we do allow appointments even if it is by appointment and that starts the ball rolling in a few months. You might come in here sometime January, February and play an HD35 that a few people have played. And it's, it's not going to be anywhere near the issue where if there's a, a really big local store in a very big city where everybody plays everything they want and nothing's taken care of, it'll never get to that. And I really feel bad for stores that have to deal with that because you can't win. You can't let everybody play everything. You can't promise the next person this guitar is really clean. Everybody gets a player or they don't. But... There's something nice to say, listen, the only time I've, I had somebody call me a month ago, I forget which guitar he was looking at, but he said, it isn't brand new. It's not in the box anymore. I said, well, it, it, that's true. It's, it's not in the box anymore, but I played it to inspect it. So we got a second set of eyes on this. And there are times my play test has found issues and it goes back to Martin. So I saved you from buying a guitar that was locked in the box. And I'm the only one who, who did play it comfortably. And then you wipe it down when it's done goes back into its case, back into its box on the on the shelf in the humidity. So it's 
I like to, to, to brag about, that's better than being new in the box because it's inspected. It's still new and it hasn't been abused. So having customers in the store does add one more level of that. You know. Yeah, that's just silly. That's like saying that's not a new car because you let other customers do a test drive. And it's not new, <laughs> you know, and that's like, new, that's like saying um, it's not new because the guy at final inspection and Martin strung it up and played it for 20 minutes, you know. <laughs> hold so, hold yeah. on, did you say 20 minutes? <laughs> oh, no, oh, no, it's time for the... <laughs> say it. It's time for the Martins and More 20 Questions. Okay, now whose turn is it to do what? So it is the wise guy's turn to think of a Martin and the nice guy's turn, meaning me. <laughs> or rather, it's the smart guy. Yes, yeah, the smart guy's turn to think of a, uh, think of a uh, Martin guitar. And the wise guy, which is me, I get 20 questions to guess which guitar it is, and that would include up to three mo guesses of what model the uh, trickster Mari Rutsch is going to come up with. All right, well, I have some, uh, let, me, let me collect my thoughts, and I do have, I wouldn't say it's a rule change, but can I, may I approach oh. the bench? Oh, I see, I see. You may approach. Yes. It might be fun sometime to have one of our loyal listeners play this game with us. Oh, that's quite true. That would be really fun if we could figure out how to do that. And th that's not going to happen today, but the next best thing has happened. This is such a fun game. Uh, one of our loyal listeners, David Belcher, emailed me back channel to say, you should use this guitar against Spoon. He'll never get it. Ah, thanks a lot, David. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, full disclosure, it ain't my fault this time, but you are never going to guess this in 20 questions. Well, but the uh, one rule is it's got to be a Martin guitar that's currently available for sale, is it? It is. Okay, well then, we will have to try our best. Ladies and gentlemen, stop what you're doing and listen. Okay, question one. Is it... A limited or special edition? No. <laughs> hmm. Is it made in Nazareth, PA? Yes. <laughs> hmm. Question number three. Does it have a dreadnought body size? No. Question number four. Does it have a spruce top? Yes. That eliminates quite a few, but remaining even more. Question five. Is it in the Modern Deluxe series? No. Question six. Is it made with the full-size dovetail neck joint? Good question, no. Question seven. Does it have mahogany back and sides? Yes. Did you give up? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a good guitar if it has mahogany back and sides. Okay, but it does have a spruce top and it's a dreadnought, is that correct? It is not dreadnought shape. Oh, it's not a dreadnought. Ah. Is it the Triple O fifteen Streetmaster? No. Okay. So question ten. Coming up to the tenth question. 
Is it among the 16 series? Yes. Question 11. Does it have six strings? Yes. Mm, humbug. <laughs> humbug. Um, so let's review, because we've been through half of it. So it's not a dreadnought. It's made in Nazareth. It's, uh, what else did I ask? It's got a spruce top. It's not made with a full-size dovetail neck joint. It's not the 15 series Streetmaster model. Oh, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. I meant to ask, is it the 00016 Streetmaster? Uh, it is not. Okay, well that was a lost right there. That was a lost uh, guess because I meant to say 16 thinking the spruce top. Too bad. So, yeah, absolutely. No refunds. Am I up to 12 now? Does it have steel strings? No. Is it the triple OC 1216E nylon? Yes. Over the green monster in left field. <laughs> you know, uh, first of all, I shouldn't be sad that you win. That's terrible etiquette. And I, I regret, David I, <laughs> David, I failed you. I should have not set this whole thing up with him thinking that you'll never guess this because that might have put something in his mind that it's an oddball. And I take full responsibility for that. Anybody listening to this show... If you do want to send us suggestions on how one of us could get one over on the other guy, I did that wrong. So, yeah, I thought for sure it was going to be the 12-string, the, uh, the uh, Grand J16E 12-string. Once, once I found out it was in the 16 series, and I thought, and, th and then the next question would have been the bass, except I already did the bass. No, I didn't do that bass. I did the junior bass. That got mm -hmm. you doing the... Uh, the um, Junior bass. Why but. do you have to bring that up now? Come on, I'm being nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just saying, you know, it goes both ways. That that I get you most of the time, and you've gotten me once. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you, David, for the suggestion. And let us know in the comments, would you enjoy it if we pulled one of you guys out of the audience to play that game with us? Yeah, thanks a lot, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, thanks a lot, Dave. Getting back to the matter at hand, I talked to you a little bit, Spoon, about the fact that we put this question to YouTube, and when we asked, you know, if, if you want to have us open the store again, do you want us to sacrifice some time doing demos, some time doing podcasts, you know, yes and no? Would you care to guess which percentage of people voted for which thing? Would you like me to run that down with you? Well, I would guess that uh, which percentage of which people? I would say that 100% of the best people said they wanted to continue with Martins and more, of course. I would too, but let's just go to the tape and see what happened. When we asked you, we're gonna open our store, but it's going to mean YouTube's gonna change a little bit. 16% of you said, yes, your in-store availability offers much more value to me. So 16% there. 36% said, no, your YouTube presence offers much more value to me. 33% said yes, but please don't stop making demos. And only 16% said yes, open your store again, but please don't stop producing podcasts. So Compared to, what was the percentage on the demos? Uh, 33. Well, I guess that says a lot about um, people who are guitar shoppers who are definitely looking uh, to buy a guitar would be more interested in the demos. That makes total sense. Uh, a smaller percentage of general population listen to podcasts. Yeah, you know, there's a large percentage of people who listen to podcasts, but only a small percentage of them probably listen to podcasts from guitar stores. 
Um, but I, yeah, I'm not surprised by that. I have another suggestion for you because not everybody uh, goes to YouTube and or goes on the internet and looks at videos. I would suggest that you put the poll up on the website too. And for people who just go to the website and see what percentages you get out of that poll um, and see that, because I think that would be interesting too if, that, if the dynamic shifts at all because maybe you get more people going to the website that don't necessarily uh, go to YouTube. And I think it's a very smart thing, too, that the versions that you put on YouTube, whether it's this podcast or, the, or some of the other videos, that you also put them in the blog on your website. And I think that's smart because there's probably a percentage of population that that's where they see them from. It's not like they get on YouTube to go to, uh, around surfing around and run into you there. There's probably a good chunk of people that that see the videos because they came upon them on your website. So um, that would be interesting, I think, if you did a, an actual text poll on the website and see what they say. I completely agree. And I really should circle back to say this is more of a talking point than anything scientific. Only 45 people took part here. So this is not the definitive answer on what to do and what directions to go. It's just something to, to talk about. Yeah, it's definitely a start. It's definitely a start. And I think, uh, yeah. I think it's important to, uh, as you get closer to the reality of this, that, that you, um, yeah, keep those polls up and see what happens over time and see, uh, see how the, uh, the weather fares uh, where that's concerned. That's very interesting. Well, I certainly hope you can work it something out. Uh, I know I've missed, you know, seeing these, like I said, the, the live visits. And, um, and I, uh, you know, I keep imagining someday where Maury's music, now that Maury's music is long past the pandemic and people are getting back to normal society where, where you end up with a, you know, even a bigger, nicer storefront so you don't have to worry about where the boxes are. But I realize that's in the future, hopefully. So, yes. Um, so, <laughs> I, uh, well, I certainly wish you luck in the endeavor. I'm sure there's everybody else who listens to this podcast does too. So, so and there's also, you know, there's certainly a uh, certainly percentage of population. You know you have big fans that uh, actually can't even buy a guitar from you because they live in Europe. So, so, you know, that internet presence is, you know, may not, it may not sell you a lot of guitars, but it's certainly... Uh, I think it still sh sh shares your popularity. Some of those people take part in the you know live audience of your shows and and have interchanges with uh, American customers. And they're also there uh, for anybody who would ask them, "Where should I buy a guitar when I'm in the states?" And, and you know that you know that kind of that kind of goodwill worth of mouth is is probably worth the time invested. So that's just lobbying for to keep the videos coming. I couldn't have said it better, and we certainly do love all of our audience, regardless of where you're watching from. I've seen on more than one occasion somebody from the U.S. asking Facebook or the forums, where should I get this or that? And a lot of you guys are in our corner. So all kidding aside, we really, really do appreciate that. And we just, as, as people, I'll speak for Spoon, we just appreciate you guys listening. We love the opportunity to talk, and I've, I haven't I've really spent a lot of time telling Spoon or anything like this off camera, but we've been really close friends for more than 20 years, but this is the first, I mean, we, we didn't regularly talk for two hours every single week or more often, and this has been a, a really great thing just for that. So if I'm gonna spend all my time talking about guitars anyway, and now I have to connect with Spoon for a couple of hours to do this, I'm a better person for having this opportunity myself. Well, that's nice of you to say. Um, and you know, also the one thing we this is a Martins and more, and we we uh, talk an awful lot about Martins and Martin related things, but it's not all we talk about. And uh, like you said, you guys have a lot of Blue Ridge guitars in uh, in tow right now. And I had proposed a a new feature uh, that's basically Spoon's top ten reasons to own a Blue Ridge guitar. And uh, so I thought we would inaugurate that series today with offering just one reason and talk a little bit about that before we finish up today. What do you think? Could that be the theme song? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm trying to think of some <laughs> cartoon character that, uh, 
that um, would would in fact use that sound. I know there used to be uh, some Muppet that had a sound like that someplace. All right, so reason number 10 for owning a Blue Ridge guitar. Parlor guitars. Ooh. Now Blue Ridge, inside their historic series, offers their version of a parlor guitar. Now, of course, a parlor guitar means a guitar that you would play in the parlor. And it evokes the 1800s, back when most guitars were very small instruments. For example, when C.F. Martin went into production uh, and opened his shop in 1833, uh, the largest guitar he made was size one, which was smaller than the size zero we have today, which is the smallest one they make. And they made them in one and two and two and a half, and they've made them in three and four and five at various times. Um, today, a parlor guitar uh, also is typically like 12 fret slot head. So Blue Ridge makes these lovely modern era speaking little guitars that put out a lot of sound. And they actually call them earthquake guitars because they think of them as the early 1900s, right at the very beginning of the steel string era. And right when, uh, that would have been right around the time when uh, Martin and Lyon Healy and Gibson and these uh, people were beginning to experience, ex experiment with steel strings. And it's based around the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. And they have uh, the, what's the equivalent of what would be a Martin 12 fret O size, but they have a long scale neck. They have a one and seven eighth inch nut width, which is what Martins really had back in those days. They are absolutely suited for steel string playing of everything from classical music to ragtime, hardcore blues, modern finger style, uh, the long scale neck, you, it, they're easy to drop down into drop D or alternate tunings. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the BR-341, the BR-361, and the BR-371. These are the Blue Ridge Earthquake Parlor guitars. Oh yeah, they really are in a class of their own. And if you're looking for something just like them, I don't know what you would really go for to compare them in a Martin. So if you're looking for that kind of style, and I call them little peanut guitars, but they they have this really nice round overall voice, whether you're looking at the Mahogany 341 or the Rosewood variants in the 361, which is Herringbone, the 371, which is the Pearly version. They really are old timey, might sound cliche, but they're that's what I think of when I see them. And we don't uh, sell as many of them as we do some of the traditional triple OMs in Blue Ridge, but the 341, the 371, and the 361 really do evoke that old timey vibe. And especially for finger pickers who want some extra room, that one and seven eighths inch nut, that alone, plus the slightly or chunky neck, makes them extremely popular regardless of how small the guitar is. So you might like the Blue Ridge idea, you might like the Blue Ridge price point, but some of the other models aren't wide enough for you at the at the fingerboard or the the actual whole feel of the neck it's worth noting these guitars are built around finger style mentality uh t you know taking the body size out of the equation so that's the way to go if you want a girthier neck and a more finger style friendly string spacing at the nut and all the way up they really are i don't want to say unrivaled but if you like that idea and you want to search other brands and other makers i'm not i'm not really sure where you would go besides them so they kind of have a little market there all their own they're not going to overtake the br160 or anything that's really traditional but if you're looking for some kind of guitar like that those three guitars really do fit the bill well 361 with the classic herringbone it looks a lot like the old style 28 uh, that Martin was using in the early 1930s, which of course they've now started using in the standard series again. But um, but the closest thing I think you could say in a Martin would be that the triple O 
15 SM because that's the 12 fret guitar with the slot head, but it's a much bigger guitar. These are smaller guitars in terms of the body size. They have a more balanced bass, bass to treble, and yet because of the 12 fret body size, they have more bass response than you would expect from, a, from an O size guitar because of that slope shoulder increasing the overall size of the sound chamber. But the Pearly 371, it's got that classic style 40 uh, slash style 42 fretboard from the pre-war Martin era. So you get the big snowflake at the fifth fret. And so you, you only get the pearl from the fifth fret uh, on up the fingerboard. And um, it's what style 42 was in that era. And it's different from modern uh, style 42 that Martin makes, which really has the fingerboard of a pre-war 45. And so you call it old timey, it definitely has a classic old timey look, uh, particularly with the slot head. And so, yes, I would hold, definitely check them out. I think for people who like that look, have always wanted a guitar like that, uh, for not a lot of money compared to uh, what a Martin would cost, I'm sure there's a lot of people who get them as a second or third guitar, not necessarily as their main guitar. But um, so, check them out. The uh, parlor guitars are the number 10 reason. To own a Blue Ridge, according to Spoon. Well, thank you very much, Spoon. That was a fun inaugural edition of Top 10 Reasons to Buy a Blue Ridge Guitar. Watch out for next week. I have a feeling we might hear about number nine. Number nine, number nine, number nine, number nine. <laughs> I'm going to go look up what that's from. And from all of us at Maury's Music, thanks for listening. Hear you later. <laughs> well, you just dated yourself there. This has been a presentation of Maury's Music, your trusted source for Martin and Blue Ridge guitars. Find us online at maurysmusic.com. <laughs>